Today we're talking about I've seen enough. I've seen enough. See, in the Easter people we're talking about are those who have interacted with Jesus after he arose from the dead. And I'm glad to say that I've interacted with Jesus since he arose from the dead. <laughs> Amen. And so, uh, but in the Bible, we see those that, you know, face to face with the resurrected Lord. And we're talking about them. We, we, we hit upon Mary Magdalene. We talked about those disciples that were in, locked in the upper, or not in the upper room, but in the room. Maybe it was upper room, but uh, the upper room is another story. But, uh, and uh, today we're going to talk about Thomas. We're going to talk about Thomas. You know, we call Thomas Doubting Thomas, right? That's when we refer to Thomas. That's how usually people refer to him, Doubting Thomas. Because, of course, he, as we're going to read in the scriptures, he doubted that Jesus had resurrected. But, you know, we don't do that to other d disciples or other Others in the Bible, we don't call Peter denying Peter. Even though that would be appropriate, I guess. Because he denied the Lord three times. And uh, denying Peter. We don't call Mark. Now, you'll have to look this up in Mark chapter 14. I believe it's verse 52. But if you look there, we'll see that as they uh, captured or took Jesus prisoner that uh, they grabbed hold of Mark's garment and he left without it and he escaped without it and so we don't call Mark ran away naked Mark talk about I've seen too much I've seen enough but we don't call him run away naked Mark but uh, so we're talking about I've seen enough, talking about doubting Thomas today. Have you ever said in your life, have you ever said, I've seen enough? Maybe someone's trying to sell you something and uh, you've already heard enough, you've already seen enough, you've already looked it over, and perhaps it's something that you say, Yes, I've seen enough, I'm sold, you can stop selling me now. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you're like, you know, just, just stop. I, I'm said no, and I'm just not, not interested. Uh, I've seen enough. Remember when Jesus appeared in the room to the ten disciples, it says that he breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And so immediately after that, I mean, talk about a life transformation. The breath of God, Jesus our Lord, breathed on them. And they received the Holy Spirit. They were born again. So immediately after that, the disciples went out to find the person who wasn't there. And that was Thomas. Why wasn't he there? Let's pick it up in John chapter 20 and we'll begin reading in verse 24. It says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So the disciples show up to... To Thomas, he said, we've seen the Lord. He breathed on us the Holy Spirit. We've received the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. We've become new creations in Christ. So you would think that his response would be, 
Wow, that's awesome. I believe. Where is he? Where can I see him? But that's not his reaction. No, Thomas was very skeptical, wasn't he? Maybe in your life you've been skeptical about things. Maybe you know others that are skeptical about things, even about things of the Bible or the Lord. Well, we can join a very, very connected biblical person. Thomas was also very skeptical. So what does this mean then? Well, we know that doubting Thomas is the skeptic. And we know that in this age that we live in, it's easier than ever to be a skeptic. We have access to so much information. You know, if I don't know something, I just say, hey, Google. Okay, Google. And then it tells me what I want to know sometimes. You ever been walking by and said something that starts talking to you? So I didn't, what did, I didn't say anything to you. Anyways. Well, we can access information just instantly pretty much. And, but through that, sometimes a lot of the information we, we know or we're skeptical about. And we don't want to be deceived because maybe in times past we have been deceived by wrong information. And we say, you know, it's probably too good to be true. I've seen enough. Just try, stop selling me on that. Maybe you've tried different pills that are advertised on television or on the social media. And, uh, you know, these pills, you take these pills and they're going to do this and that. And, and, of course, you know, the fine print, these have not been tested. These have not been approved. But we've taken your word for it. Maybe it's just any kind of health supplements. And then later we do enough online research or whatever, and we find out that there's really no benefit. And you say, you know what, I've seen enough. And so you're very skeptical. Maybe things like, uh, you know, compression sleeves that you want to put on your aching joints or whatever. But, you know, you've got to get the copper-infused ones. I mean, the copper-infused ones because copper makes it better. Then you look at the research and the data and you say, oh, this, the copper doesn't really work, but the compression is, is probably something good. And so you realize that you've seen enough and you're skeptical then when you hear other claims. Of course, we've all heard the promises in political campaigns. And we've heard the stories and we've heard... I'm going to do this, you elect me, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. We've heard claims and promises. And then after they're elected, we find out that uh, they weren't accurate in their promise and in their claim. And so guess what? We're a little bit skeptical. When we hear political promises, you said, I've seen it before, I've seen enough. It's too good to be true. Sometimes, mostly it is. There's some things that maybe I could tell you, some facts, and you would say, you know what, I just don't know if I can believe that or not. Did you know that uh, Australia, the continent, is exactly as wide as the moon? It's true. Australia, the continent, is exactly as wide as the moon. Did you know that instead of calling South America, South America, that we should probably call it East America? It should be called East America because uh, South America is east of Florida. If you look at the, the globe and you go down, it's actually east of Florida. So maybe it should be East America. But you're skeptical. You might be saying, I just don't know if I believe that. Because you've been tricked in the past. You know, trick me once. Shame on me. Trick me twice. No, sh sh I got it backwards. Tr trick me once. Shame on you. Trick me twice. Shame on me. Right? We're skeptical. Thomas was skeptical. I mean, what a claim that they'd seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. Even though Jesus had 
had foretold that he was going to be risen from the dead. Even though the disciples, who they had they'd walked with the Lord all these years, is saying, we've seen the Lord. He's one out of the eleven. One out of the ten saying, yes, we've seen the Lord. Thomas, come on. Get with us on this. He still didn't believe until he actually saw the Lord. Sometimes we're, we're skeptical. Jesus said to Thomas, he said, stop doubting and believe. I think that's a pretty powerful statement. Stop doubting and believe. So we can stop doubting. We can make a choice to stop doubting and to believe. And that's why we've always referred to Thomas as doubting Thomas. But aren't you glad that God doesn't do that with us? Aren't you glad that God doesn't find the worst thing about us and then attach that to our name? Right? I'm so glad that God doesn't see our sin. He only sees his son. He calls you his child. He calls you a, a child of God. And that's how we know that we're his. Aren't you glad that he loves us no matter if we've failed maybe? So, you know, you might be saying to yourself, you know, I've, I've been a failure as a parent. Uh, I blew it as a boss of, uh, as a boss of these employees Maybe you even feel like, and you've said to yourself, you know, I'm not even a good Christian, so why would anybody believe what I'm saying about the Lord? Maybe you think that you're a terrible example. Maybe you even say, God, how could you even love me? I've failed, I've messed up, I've, I've tripped up. But you know what? He says, I see you, but I see you in Christ. I see you as a child of God. I see you as redeemed and as bought with the precious blood of Jesus. I see my righteousness when I look at you. He's hidden us in Christ. God only sees us. He only sees his son. And he only sees Thomas as the son of God covering the darkest moment. I'm sure God the Father, the heavenly host, do not refer to Thomas as doubting Thomas. You know, we could call, even from the scriptures, we could call Thomas, Thomas the Honest. We could say Thomas the Honest. You know, there's a need for honesty as we, in these days, sometimes it doesn't seem like we know who to trust. We don't know what news is real. But Thomas in the scriptures had an honest moment. Jesus was telling the disciples that he was going to leave this world and go to heaven. And Jesus said, you guys know where I'm going. Like, you know where I'm going. I'm going to leave, but you know where I'm going. Right? <laughs> the disciples were all acting like they knew. Oh, yeah, yeah, we know where you're going. Yeah, right. Hmm. But Thomas, in John chapter 14, verse 5, he says this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. <laughs> so how can we know the way? He was honest. We don't know where you're going. And then, you know, the rest probably admit, well, you know, yeah, we, we really don't have a clue where you're going. <laughs> Sometimes we're a little dense, right? We follow the Lord, but, but he does still love us, and he does get through to us if we will keep following. We just keep following, even though sometimes we get it wrong. But Thomas was honest. Thomas the honest. We could also refer to Thomas as Thomas the brave. Thomas the brave. So instead of doubting Thomas, Thomas the doubter, or Thomas the honest, we could also say he's Thomas the brave. Remember when Jesus told the disciples that his close friend Lazarus had died. They got news that he had died and uh, Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters. And yet, for some reason, he stayed away several days. He didn't go immediately while Lazarus was sick to be able to, uh, you know, heal Lazarus like he had healed so many. So why would he do that? Because we know he had a, a, a greater plan. 
And it didn't make sense to Mary as Jesus finally did show up. It didn't make sense to her. She was weeping. So she was totally in distress. And, and then Martha, she was just mad. She was just mad. And so, but we all grieve a little bit differently. But they were in grief, the grief of things when we have loss of a loved one. We have loss of things. Sometimes we grieve not only the relationship we have with them, but we grieve that the, the way life used to be has changed. We grieve maybe that the things that we wanted to do, the trips we wanted to go on, the, you know, even the job maybe that you've lost or the savings you've lost, whatever it is, uh, can cause you to be angry, cause you to be sad. And we grieve about the losses that we have. But the word came that Lazarus was dead. So now Jesus goes after it's too late. And all the disciples are confused. Jesus says, now I'm going to go and I'm going to wake him from, from death. Thomas bravely says in John 11 verse 16. John, uh, Thomas says, let us also go. That we may die with him. So here's Thomas the brave. Because they knew that if he would go, that, you know, the, the leadership, the, the people there were, were plotting to, to get Jesus. And they were all, of course, fearful of that. At least the disciples were. And he says, you know what? Let us also go. Just let us also go that we may die with him. Sounds like a warrior, doesn't it? Sounds like I am brave. Thomas the brave, though misguided. <laughs> because if they all die, then who's going to be able to do anything and do any, any of the works that Jesus had called us to do? So I commend Thomas for his bravery, but we still remember him as Thomas the doubter. When others were scared, he showed bravery. Though at the other big moment that he had an opportunity to be brave, as he witnessed and heard about and the terrible crucifixion of Jesus, at that moment he succumbed to the doubt. He thought he had seen Enough to prove that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the one they were waiting for, the miracles and the incredible things. And even here as we talk about the res, uh, Lazarus being called from the dead and rising from the dead. I believe that Thomas really, at the crucifixion of Jesus, his death and burial, that he felt abandoned. He felt alone. He felt like... As he become so full of doubt, he couldn't understand that this could happen to the Lord who they'd followed all these months and years. All the great teaching and all the, the hope that he brought and all the miracles and signs and wonders. But Thomas doubted. But I want you to know that there is hope for the skeptic. There is hope for those that have refused to believe have felt abandoned. And that's what Thomas felt abandoned. We could say Thomas the abandoned. But I would say it's more like Thomas felt abandoned because we know he was not abandoned. If you ever feel like you're abandoned, if you ever feel like you're alone, I want you to know it's just how you feel because you are not alone and you have not been abandoned. Thomas had felt that Jesus had abandoned him and when he could have believed, he said, I've seen enough. I can't bear anymore. I thought Jesus was the one. We know that Thomas had been honest. He had been brave. But in this moment, he doubted. Maybe you doubt some things. Maybe you question God. Is, 
the world ever going to be the same after COVID? <laughs> Are we ever going to move on? Are we ever going to get over all the things that have happened to our liberties? All the things that have happened, and sometimes we believe, and then find out, oh, the data was really not what they said it was. Is there any hope for our kids who've missed out on education over the last few years? Is there any hope that they can recover from the things that they have had to deal with? And sometimes we doubt. Where's God? Maybe in times you've been brave, maybe you've been honest, just as Thomas was. But now you feel abandoned. Now you feel full of doubt. So why would we feel abandoned? Well, sometimes the absence causes unbelief. Absence and unbelief kind of fuel one another. Absence and unbelief the greater his absence, the greater removed from the other disciples, greater the absence, of course, of Jesus, greater his unbelief grew. So we see that first day that the, the ten were gathered on Sunday and Thomas was absent from those who could encourage, pray, build up his faith and hold him accountable to his trust in God. He gave in to unbelief, which was the easier way. And that's the easier way because of absence. So when you're beginning to doubt, when you're beginning to wonder about things, don't fall into the same trap that Thomas did and he separated himself. He became absent. Don't stay alone. The Bible tells us over and over that it's together, that we need to walk together, that we need one another. And it says it in Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we shouldn't become more absent when things are tough, when things are causing us to be full of doubt. No, we should be getting together more because we need more strength from one another. We need more encouragement. We need to be spurred on to love and good deeds. We need to be spurred on. We need the body. We need the family of God. So the skepticism that Thomas had could have been helped by meeting together. See, churches are not people who meet to polish their halos. How wonderful we are. You know, so people say, well, you know, I can't come to church because I yelled at my kids. So I've disqualified myself from church today or this week. I'm really frustrated all the time. I'm frustrated at my job and I'm really worried about things and I'm worried about this and that and I'm just so worried, you know, I just... I just don't qualify to come and be at church because all those people have it together and they're full of faith. They're full of love. And I'm just not feeling it, so I'm not going to gather with the others at church. I'm not going to meet at Celebrate Recovery because all of those have their lives together as well. <laughs> Even though it's for everyone with hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and that's all of us, <laughs> Right? No, that's the same thing. That's what church is all about. We're not here polishing our halos, but we're here because we've become new creations in Christ on the inside. We need to come together for worship. We need to come together to receive the word of God. We need to come together to receive communion together. We need to come together and pray. We need to come and make the body of Christ what is meant to be a shining light to all those around us that we've been redeemed We've been bought with a precious price that we have been born again. And he's still working in us, creating a new, a new uh, life in us as we, as we're becoming restored in the, in the thinking of our minds and 
We're growing in him every day. Aren't you glad that when you were growing up and you made a mistake, your parents say, well, that's it. You can't be in the family anymore. You made a mistake. You tried to walking, walking when you were a year and a half, but you fell. So you're out. That's why Jesus calls us to follow. He keeps saying, come follow me, follow me, follow me. We keep following him. He still loves us. He keeps leading and guiding us as we allow him to do that. Even though we fail, mess up, make mistakes. And that's what the church is all about. But Thomas, he was absent. And when he was absent, his unbelief grew. And then we can come to what the disciples did. They were persistent. Persistence and kindness to Thomas. Persistence and kindness to, to Thomas. That was their reaction. Thomas hears the disciples. We have seen the Lord. And that's the message that we all can tell everyone. We have seen the Lord. We have seen him come into our hearts and lives. And by faith, we see a transformation and a change in people's lives and our lives. And that's the message that we have to tell the Lord, too. We have seen the resurrected Lord. We know Jesus is alive. But we see that in the scriptures, Thomas didn't believe now, what could the disciples have done? They said, oh, well, that's, that's Thomas. That's his decision. Well, let's just go our way. Let's just be about our wonderful life with Jesus. We know he's alive. But that's not what they did. They could have turned their back on him. In the Greek, in this translation of the, uh, that we have in the, the Greek text, Suggest that they did not give up on Thomas. But it, the scripture says that they kept on telling and inviting him. They kept on telling and inviting him. It wasn't one time, hey, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. See you later. No, they kept on telling him. They kept on inviting him. Come on, be a part with us. Even though he... He, be, he did, chose not to believe. They still wanted him to be a part. They didn't give up on him. So that is what we also need to do. Create a church that's a safe space for people who maybe have a little dip in their journey. Maybe they're not up in the same place of faith that you are. Maybe they have some doubts. But that's okay because so have we. And Jesus did not turn his back. The disciples did not turn their back on Thomas. See, we, uh, some of us are very kind, but not persistent. Some of us are very kind, but not persistent. We love people, but we're not telling them that we've seen the Lord. And we've not kept on telling them that we've seen the Lord. Well, I told them that one time. I gave my testimony that one time. I told them what God did for me. I prayed for them that one time, but they still don't believe and they still have separated themselves. But no, they said they kept on telling him. They kept on persistently. And so they weren't just kind and loving, but they were persistent with their kindness and their love. Now, others of us are being persistent, but not kind. <laughs> you can be persistent and not kind. See, it takes truth and love for us to touch people and let them know of Jesus in our hearts and lives and that he can be in theirs. It takes truth and it takes love. You notice Jesus, when he showed up there and Thomas was there in that room, he says, peace. He says, peace be to you. Peace be to you, Thomas. See, these are the first words to the one who was offensive in his disbelief was peace. And that should be our response as well. Those who will not believe, but will continue to be as they were persistent and kind. We have love and truth. And then we see that Jesus speaks hope to the skeptic still. Peace to you. He says, Thomas, I'm not mad at you. I love you. I died on the cross for you, but I've risen from the dead. 
And so Thomas has an encounter with Jesus. He says, my Lord and my God. This is a powerful and concise declaration. I believe you are God. I believe you are deity. You have risen from the dead. Here you are in front of me. But notice that Jesus says, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen me yet believe. We are blessed because we believe even though we have not seen him in bodily form. We know just as the wind blows, we see the results of the wind and the trees and the leaves blow and the, the limbs bend. We see the results of the Spirit of God breathing in upon us. Our lives are changed from the inside out. You're a miracle. You're transformed by the power of the resurrected Lord. Now, it's interesting. We also see that Thomas believed and we see the results of his life. If you will look in some of the uh, different uh, information that's out there about Thomas. It's not in the scriptures, but we can know that all the disciples who believed. It says that Thomas arrived in India in 52 AD. He was in the country of India. He preached the gospel and established churches at seven places and appointed bishops and priests. He was martyred by being thrust through with a spear just as Jesus had the spear thrust through him. He died. He was martyred because he trusted and he put his faith in Jesus Christ. He stopped doubting. And he believed even to the uttermost, giving his life for the gospel. Thomas's story tells us that we're not limited by where we started. We can feel abandoned, but we can know that he is with us. And we will continue with persistence and kindness to draw us near. So we can de declare in faith that he is present now with us. That he is near even though he may feel far. And then when you do that you'll find the blessings. That come to those who believe even though they don't see. It's faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And in that faith we are rewarded and blessed. With his presence, his goodness, his help, his strength, his power. Even though we may not see him, even though we may not know how he's working. He is working. He is working in you for his good pleasure to bring forth the fruit, the precious fruit of the earth. We don't know how he's working. We don't see it sometimes, but we don't need to. <laughs> we don't need to. We've seen enough. I've seen enough. You've seen enough. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for every person here. We've seen enough of your power and love and grace in our lives. And though there might be difficulties that we face, though there might be trials, though there might be opportunities to doubt, Lord, we will choose to stop doubting and keep believing because we know you're with us. Even though we may not feel it, even though we may not know how you're working, Lord, we still choose to trust you. And so, Lord, I pray for every person here today that they would be called the brave. They'd be called the honest. They'd be called followers of Jesus Christ. And we will starve our doubts to death and we will feed our faith to life and walk with you every day. And we will see the hand of the Lord. We will see uh, God use each one to reach family, friends, neighborhoods. We will see people reached with the saving grace and power of Jesus Christ. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.